Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be addressing a very common problem for Sega Game Gears, which is the loss of screen visibility due to the failure of their capacitors. This is so common that I'd be willing to bet that maybe about 1 out of every 10 are still working today. The other 9 will need some fixing, and that's exactly what we will be working on next. The first step before doing anything is to clean the cartridge slot and pins to make sure this unit is working as best as possible. I've talked about using these Naki Eliminator cleaning carts in my Game Boy refurbishment video right here, but these are great little kits. They work well to clean up the pins and don't take too much time either. Just add the solution to the cart and pop it in and out to start cleaning. Wipe off the dirt with a Q-tip and continue this process until the Q-tips start coming away clean. Speaking of clean, this is a very clean, slightly more rare blue version of the Sega Game Gear. Even though it has some scratches and scuffs from use, it's in really great shape. Hopefully the insides look just as nice. After making sure the cartridge slot is clean, let's test it so I can show you the effects that bad capacitors can have on the screen. Well, the sound certainly works. Let's turn that down a little bit. As you can see, even after adjusting the brightness, the screen doesn't really display at all when you're looking at it directly. You have to tilt it at a weird angle to just barely see the colors, and even then, it's hard to make it out. It's like trying to play a game while you're looking through a mail slot from three feet away. Kind of difficult and in no way good for your posture. The good news is the screen works and it doesn't look like it has any other defects like missing pixels or a cracked LCD. The buttons all appear to be working too, which is great to know. And we certainly know the sound is working. The LCD displaying anything is a bit of a surprise to me, and we should consider ourselves lucky. When the caps go bad, a majority of the time it displays a blank screen, and you have to hope it doesn't have any issues by the time you're done replacing everything. We at least know this unit is working before we started doing anything on the inside, so if something else is broken when we are done, it's probably our fault. Another very common problem for Game Gear units is battery corrosion. Thankfully, this unit is in great shape and doesn't have any. But let's crack it open to see the insides. There are seven screws in the back, and the middle top one is a larger 4.5 millimeter game bit screw. Take your time with this one since it can get stripped out and is an absolute pain to remove then. The housing opens like a clamshell, and there are three separate circuit boards inside that are all connected together. Don't just pull the halves apart, as this may damage the connectors or the cables. Open it up from the bottom and pull each connector out carefully to separate the halves. The back side of this shell houses the sound and power boards. And yes, the caps here need to be replaced too. The power board is actually the easiest board to do, but we'll get into that part a little bit later. Now the main board is what houses the majority of the caps, and the screen is built into it as well. And don't panic if your game gear doesn't look exactly like this one. There are a few different versions of the motherboard, and I'll show you a super handy website that has all the schematics and reference materials for those versions in just a minute. Let's first take this out of its housing so it's easier to work with. The main board has eight screws to remove it from the front shell, and they're all really easy to get to. Then carefully pull it up from the shell and check for any pads stuck to the front like this. Over time, these can get stuck in place and it sucks to lose one of these small ones. We will get these as well as the buttons cleaned up for the final assembly later. The front shell also has the speaker attached to it instead of the main board. I'm not sure why Sega separated it from everything, but it is a bit of a pain to replace if it ever goes bad. These are the only new parts that we'll be adding to the Game Gear. A brand new flat glass front screen protector that will also resist some scratching unlike the old plastic bubble version. And a set of brand new capacitors. The cap kits are normally labeled and are very well organized in small baggies, so there's less of a chance to mix them up during install. Let's remove the old caps first though. There are a total of 12 on the main board to pop off. They are all glued to the motherboard, and I like to take a pair of tweezers and break them all away and tilt them upward. Then I can go back and cut the legs with a pair of side cutters. You may have noticed that these are SMD parts, or surface mounted caps, and we have through hole replacements. This is very common to see in the replacement kits, and is actually a bit easier to install if you only have a soldering iron. The handheld will still be fixed regardless of what type of cap you use, but I can say that using through hole caps instead doesn't look as clean as the SMDs when you're done. After cutting away all the old, I like to go back through and clean up all the areas with IPA in case some of them were leaking. 
Oops, must have missed this one. After I'm done cleaning, I'll go back and remove any of the old cap legs still soldered to the pads, while also adding a little new solder to each of the locations too. This will aid in the install of the new parts. I'll come back to the tan color ones in a bit since they look like they may need some additional rework, but those will also be getting replaced as well. The tan caps. The solder around them is looking a bit gray and dull, so I'm guessing these were the reason the screen isn't working well. I'm going to remove these in the same way that I did the others, but with some additional cleaning steps. Like scraping the top of the solder to remove the tarnish, and using some extra flux to clean the area while adding my new solder to the pads. Now I mentioned earlier that there are a few different versions of these circuit boards. The left outer edge will tell you what version you have right here. There's a wonderful website called console5.com that will also show the details of each version. They have a full list of all the caps and their locations with maps of where all of them go. These are super helpful reference materials, so in case you need to check where a specific cap needs to go, you have all the info available at your fingertips. Let's discuss capacitors for a second. Through-hole parts are not meant for surface-mounted boards, so they require a little modification to work. I like to bend the outer legs out and back in at an angle so that they are at the right width for the install on the boards like this. Polarity matters for these installs too, which means you can put these in backwards. There are a few markings on each to aid you in the install though. The side of the caps will have a mark down it. On these it's either gray or gold, but it'll show you the location of the negative terminal leg. They also have different sized legs too. The shorter leg is the negative and the longer leg is the positive. Sega must have made these circuit boards with future replacements in mind since the positive or plus symbol is actually printed on the board for each cap location. As well as listing the polarity for each cap, they also have labels like C42 right here. You can reference which cap goes where on the console 5 page I've included in the description, but I also will include them during the video in case you'd like to follow along. The red highlighted parts are what we will be installing next. Trimming the legs on each cap so they are tight to the board when soldered in place is a necessity. The legs are too long and if installed at this length, it'll probably cause fitment issues with the shell. I like to tin the legs once they're cut and hold the new cap in my left hand while I'm soldering with my right. Tweezers are very helpful for holding the caps and in tighter spots, they're pretty much required. Soldering in these parts is a little backwards to the traditional process though. I like to add solder to the tip of the iron rather than adding it after the joint is heated since I'm out of hands. As a result, the joints won't look as nice, but they are still attached well. The four small gold discs you'll see around the board are areas that cannot be covered by any components whatsoever. These are the back of the button pad locations and the shell has posts built into it so it can hold the board in place. This is most likely to prevent any extra stress on the board from button presses. But just keep this in mind while installing since some of these caps will be very close to overlapping on those spots. Take your time through this entire process though and check each cap's polarity once it's installed. Clean up when you're done and move on to the other two smaller boards.
The shielding for the cartridge needs to be removed in order to access the soundboard on the left. Once that is gone, there are only two screws in each board. The soundboard can pop out easily, but the power board has a plastic cover over the battery terminals that will need to be removed first. Many times this isn't that sticky and can pop off pretty easily, but like this one, sometimes it needs some additional help. As I said earlier, the power board is the easiest to have the caps replaced on. It only has three, and they are all through-hole parts. I like to trim the bottom legs of the caps, and then use a desoldering ribbon to clean out all the old solder. Each cap should pop out after a little wiggle. Then just slide your new caps in. These have the positive and negative side labeled on the board as well. The negative being the white stripe as seen in the markings that go down the sides of the replacements. Solder them in place. Trim the legs. Clean the board. Easy peasy, this one's done. The soundboard, however, has more SMD caps. So do the same process as we did on the main board. Cut them off, remove the bases and legs, Remove the plastic parts too. Then add some new solder to the pads to get them ready for the new caps. Clean up afterwards and add your new caps in place. The difference with this one is it's a small board that needs to fit five caps on it, and it's really tight. This is how I lay them out, but I'm sure there are other ways that'll work just as good. Pay special attention to the top right cap since the cartridge shielding covers that area when installed. Once you're done with this one, it's time for reassembly. Just add everything back in reverse order and you should be good. Rather than clean the buttons and pads with soap and water, I'm just going to do a quick wipe down with some IPA. These don't look so bad, and it will take far less time this way. Then before reinstalling the buttons, we'll need to remove that old scratched up front screen protector. Just carefully push on the back side, and it will eventually release from the shell. Whatever adhesive they used is ultra sticky though, and much of it tends to stay behind on the shell. Use whatever tool you have available to you and start scratching it all away bit by bit. If you scratch the housing in this area, don't worry since none of it will be seen once we add the new front back on. Then just clean up the sticky remnants with IPA. Speaking of cleaning, let's do a quick wipe down of the main board too. We're here and it might as well be as clean as possible before we close everything up. On to the final assembly. Put the buttons and pads in first and make sure they are seated properly, otherwise they will pop out of place when you put in the main board. One quick note though, the wire for the speaker goes under the main board and is fed up around the pins in the shell. Make sure you don't close it up behind the main board like I did and pop it out the top like this instead. Continue to reinstall all the screws and cables in reverse order and the housing should be buttoned up in no time. Before adding in any outer screws though, if you're having trouble closing it up, just wiggle both sides of the shell and it should pop into place. Clean the screen with a soft cloth or a microfiber towel to remove any dust. I also like to use canned air afterwards just to get any little particles left behind by the towels. Once you feel it's 100% clean, add on the last puzzle piece that is the screen protector and push firmly on the edges to seat it in place.
I really like the look of the glass, but I can't decide if this is my favorite or the original bubbled look is. Leave a comment down below as to which one you prefer. Let's test it out and see how the screen looks with the new caps. Well, we know the sound still works, maybe even a little louder than before. The picture quality is much better too. The colors look nice and bright, and you can now see it fully when looking at it straight on. It's not the best screen to ever grace the video game world, but it does look a heck of a lot better than it did before, and is now way more playable. I'm going to go ahead and clean this up off camera, and let's do a proper showcase for the new look. Roll the clip. As always, thank you for watching, and we'll see you next fix.